Fucking off air. Yeah. 13 Boughton. Boughton, yeah. But, uh, sorry, Boughton. I do yeah. apologise. Boughton. Right. Get down there. <laughs> <laughs> you don't use a sir. Why not? I guess it's... Um, it's a generational thing. I mean, in our grandpa, you know, in our grandparents' day, it was all the sort of rigueur, and you get nice cream tea and claridges and all that sort of stuff. But I think times have changed. I think titles and um, you know, to some degree, uh, awards and and everything like that are in the eye of the beholder. You know, sort of what people think of you when you when you use it or when you don't use it. It's much easier not to explain. It's much easier not to you know not to. Um, not to have to explain on it, but it's great for getting a table in a restaurant. But, you know, it, I find that a lot of doors actually, funnily enough, become closed if you start banding it around because they assume that you are uh, either posh or um, sort of above your station or, you know, that, that sort of thing. So for me in the work that I do, it's much easier not to, not to, not to use it. And you get and you get overcharged, maybe. Yeah, I probably get overcharged as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's probably <a> definite. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, your mate, your background is one varied. Yeah, be a, a, a very uh, what's the word? It's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, an understated way of putting <laughs> it, and uh, an accomplished, very accomplished. Um, from 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 what I say, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, uh, Royal Navy, Army. Pilot, military pilot, civvy pilot. Yeah. Uh, what else? What else? What else is there? How did you? When did you join up? So I, I joined up from. I did CCF at school and CCF. Uh, sorry, combined cadet force. Okay. You know, sort of um, you know, playing around soldiers, and um, I didn't want to go straight to university. So um, I found out there's this thing called the short service limited commission where you go to Sandhurst for eight weeks, go and join a battalion or regiment and have a year on them um, basically being in charge of a platoon, although you're never in charge of a platoon, platoon sergeant's in charge of the platoon. And um, and uh, and basically, you know, learning what about the army is all about. And, it, and the SSLC is designed for the person that um, effectively never really actually intends to join the army. They're, they're the person that goes in and gets some experience of it lives the life, goes, yep, that's brilliant, really great fun, and then goes out into the city world. And when they're in their job as a high-powered executive, they turn around and go, I remember my time in the army, absolutely brilliant. Of course you can go on reserve training days, you know, to the, to, to the team. And I came back from that, and that was with the Gurkhas in Hong Kong. So I, I lucked out of, of all my SSLC course, there were people going to Northern Ireland, uh, not to Northern Ireland, to Verl in Germany or to... One went to Cyprus, I think. And then I got the sort of, oh, how'd you fancy Hong Kong? And it was just like, <laughs> result. You know, 17 and a half year old second lieutenant in Hong Kong. Just legendary time for... What was that place yeah. like then? What it, was the lifestyle it was, like? It was, it was like... It was like... Uh, 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 you know, I don't know if it's the correct thing to say or the politically correct thing to say, but it's like it was like the British Empire. You know, <laughs> you, you rock out there as a... Um, platoon commander with the Gurkhas. Um, I was met at the airport by my Gurkha captain and, um, and you know, all suits and tie and everything. Got taken to the mess, um, got told to dump my kit, my orderly, I was introduced to my orderly. Um, and the orderly function in the Gurkhas is one very much of function. I mean, you are there to teach them English. They're, they are the shooting stars of the battalion. So they need to learn English. They need to learn it well. So effectively, you're teaching them English and they are teaching you Nepalese. So, you know, I'd speak to Nepalese to him and he'd speak to English and me, which to me. And that was the way the relationship worked. But the sub part of that was, you know, you come back from a uh, weekend on the lash with a massive hangover at six o'clock on Monday morning and find your kit all immaculately pressed with bald boots. Um, <laughs> but even then, you know, you never abused that. The relationship was one very much of a you know, trusted relationship and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, you know, a sort of trust across not just him helping you or you helping him, but to help, it helped me learn what the regiment ethos was all about and how to, you know, not drop any clangers. Like you never point at a Gherky, use your thumb and things like that. It's all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did a year of that and literally had a whale of a time. 
And then I came back and I went to Bristol. Um, and I sort of missed the military side. And, and at that time I had a bursary from the army. I think I've worn, I've worn more headdresses than uh, certainly most people I know. So I started off with a Gurkha one. I then got a bursary with the army air corps. So I was wearing an army air corps berry. I then went off and, and did the hills bit with um, our troop 264 um, at Hereford, which is a reserve um, troop. And was a troop commander there. Um, and I then thought at that stage, you know what, I've uh, this university lark is, you know, I, I, it's more fun being in the army. So I dropped my course, much to my father's uh, chagrin, and um, I went straight into Sandhurst uh, for the long course. Did a year doing that, and then did really badly at Sandhurst, you know, terribly at Sandhurst. And then... Um, Are you being serious? Yeah, yeah, no, I was <laughs> terrible. I was crap. But <laughs> I think they were short of officers that year, so um, I got through. But um, but then ended up with the Royal Highland Fusiliers. So I then shipped to Glengarry on my head and a 2S. Yeah. And the RHF was a funny regiment. It was um, it, The officers were made up of either sons of the regiment, Scottish people, or Chelsea Highlanders like me. And um, <laughs> Chelsea I, I, Highlanders, I've never heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> and the guys were fantastic you know i had a i had a fantastic platoon sergeant um john mcdermott who sadly was killed in afghanistan as an early captain mentoring the afghan police um and um but i had a real shit as a as a company commander who really didn't teach me how to be an infantry officer so of course i went on the platoon commander's battle course failed that the first time which was unheard of in the scottish um scottish uh, regiment and I went back and my CO was a X22 guy. Um, and he just took me aside and, and, and just nurtured me and said, right, we haven't taught you. We need to teach you. Um, and this is what you need to be doing and thinking of. And John McDermott got hold of me and, and sort of the second time I went back and I got an instructor's pass. So it was what formulating days, I think. Then. So, sorry, I'm just going to move this. It's my fault. I'll be banging, banging into it. Sorry, don't worry. Right. Um, so hang on a minute. Second lieutenant. Yeah. I was, my, so my my experience with uh, second lieutenant coming to the battalion, um, and this would be different across the units, you know, with three power was <clears throat> the second lieutenant comes, they go straight into a platoon commander's role. Uh, that's from my experience, go straight into a platoon commander's role, marking time until they got the PCD. Uh, and that, down to the PCD. And that's the same. So I had right. five platoon B company, um, but it, it it was we were a uh, home service battalion based out of Oakington. Not a lot going on. You're doing loads of rat tasks, which you remember what they're like. You know, sort of. I need twenty men here. Do this, that, and the other. So we weren't doing any soldiering. It was it was presentational stuff, or you know, it was um, in barracks training. So I never really got the the the, the training that that guys get now when they go to a battalion, you know, off the back of experiences in Iraq or Afghanistan, um, to really train their officers. And I think it's a key point because I think that what we push out of Sandhurst now, vice what we pushed out of Sandhurst in my day, was that we are pushing out a much better trained, supported um, officer than, than was previously before, where it was sink or swim. Um, and by the way, if you sink, we're not going to help you. You know, you'll just find your way out of the battalion in three years, and, and, and that'll be that. So it's almost selection of the fittest. Um, but I think what that did for me, that RHF experience did for me, was that in the three years that I was with them, four years that I was with them, it really, um, it really set the platform for how I wanted to interact with soldiers and enlisted personnel for the rest of my life in that I um, was damn sure that I was never going to treat anyone like I was treated within that battalion context. Um, and it worked. You know, for me, you know, I don't regret any time with them at all. We deployed to Bosnia, um, had a fairly um, uh, eventful time in Bosnia. Um, and then when I came back from that, I then get seconded off to three Royal Irish as an ops officer um, with an X22CO. Um, who was who really took care to nurture his officers, and I think for me that was the turning point in my whole military career. Was up to then, I'd never 
been shown the ropes properly as to how to do your job. And this guy, he was a guy as a CEO of a, a battalion who really was keen on allowing you to have flair, allowing you to make mistakes, but learn from them. But he was there to catch you and he was there to, to instruct you if you needed it. Um, and that time in the Royal Irish for me, although it was a very short time, um, was, uh, was, was brilliant fun. And the local Irish people, because it was a home service battalion, you know, this whole, whole idea of red areas and places where you couldn't go, oh, went out the window, you know, just go downtown with the local, you know, um, uh, sort of soldiers who lived in the area. Uh, and it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. It's, it's interesting that um, as you were talking, things that I read about you earlier popped into my head. I think, oh, guys, that and that and that and that and that. And, that. <laughs> and one of the things uh, I read about, um, and, co- and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm broadly speaking, is, you are, um, I you use the word expert. I try to reduce the how much I use the word export for expert for anyone now, including myself. You are very, very knowledgeable, experienced in the area of mental mental health, but not just from a negative perspective. How how to improve it? Certainly for organisations, individuals, uh, for different things, improving productivity, blah, yada yada yada. Now that popped in my head there because it's interesting you said about your own experiences very positive on the whole with one or two could be looked at as sort of very impactful negative experiences which is not unlike what what my career is like in the military where i was very very fortunate to have uh, so my uh, one ups and two ups very very fortunate for the most part all the way through were good good Mm. people um led by example very intelligent men um yeah, led by example, very intelligent men and knew how to get the best out of their their teams, their platoons, their companies. Um, and, and the way you do that in the military is different, certainly infantry and power uh, and, well, whatever infantry you're air, whether you're airborne or not, is very different to the way you do it in Civvy Street. But so almost the same principles apply. Um, but when I had the bad experiences, much like yourself, obviously on a different scale, I that sort of that that hammered home how important the good experiences are and to take from those people who were brilliant the lessons. Um, it took me a while to apply on mine. It takes a long time to learn it, you know, and be able to apply it down. <clears throat> but when you know those things, it almost becomes a a pleasure um, going forward when you come to command or lead or manage a group of people and you because you you know how to apply it and the and the impact it has on them. You know, from a, a welfare perspective, and them having a positive outlook on their job, and and how it doesn't impact their personal life too much in a negative way, but also the impact that has on your productivity, your, your, what you can achieve. Yeah. I mean, I, I up until I had PTSD in two thousand and eight, I would never have, um, I would never have thought a that I would get it, but b, I'd never really understood what we could do to minimize the chances of, of of it happening and i think the culmination for me was a whole raft of experiences from ethnic cleansing in bosnia um sites of which it just you know it's just horrendous and you know uh losing people in helicopter crashes so i lost 48 friends in helicopter crashes uh, throughout my 20 years of flying i've been to 26 funerals i've carried 15 coffins you know it, it, it just you just you almost become immune to death death does not mean anything and i think uh that when i when i then sort of crumbled a it was my wife at the time that 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 recognized it um along with my daughter who basically sort of said are we going to get good daddy or are we going to get baddie that bad daddy back and nobody really explained just the the how powerful the brain is and what the brain can do to a person but we have to exercise the brain. The brain is a muscle just like, you know, the rest of the body. So we have to be physically fit. We have to be mentally fit. And an ex- a prime example of that is, is P Company. So you have the P Company staff, which you know well, and their ethos is that they want you to pass. But my God, they'll shout at you. They'll scream at you. They'll swear at you. And they'll tell you you're crap and that you tell you you can't do it. And, you, you know, and we had that up at Catering. And we took the P Company staff and we said to them, look, 
let us train you in this mental resilience training about setting goals, about you know mental positive imagery, about mental rehearsal, about um, dealing with negative thoughts, all these things. Let us teach you the instructors so you can use these tools on the people that are coming through. And we were finding that P Company actually, uh, up until you know that time, was having <coughs> a really bad um, uh, success rate amongst the Joes that are going through. And we took the, the staff, and the staff said, no, we, we, the bollocks, we don't, we don't want to do that. So I said, look, well, you can carry on having a, you know, a, a bad success rate, or you can let us help. So we helped them, and we, uh, sort of say, we, the, the, the training team ran this MRT course. And the success rate on the first one they did just went rocketed uh, in terms of what happened. And I'll give you an example. The, there's a guy on the Trinasium, um just rooted. You know, staff, right, go, rooted. Um, one, of the chance. One, one of the, one of the, one of the, one of the, on the Trinasium. On the top. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, top. got you. Yeah. Second time, go, <clears throat> rooted. And it's like, right, third time, and then you're, you're out. Um, <clears throat> right, third time, go, just stood. Right, you down, off, failed. And that's you done. And we sort of said, okay, well, let, let, let's just go back there and visit it. Let's put one of the team up there with him and let's find out what's going on. So got him up over the seesaw, everything up to the Trinasium. So you're present on P Company? No, I wasn't there. No, okay. no, no, this is the team that was doing this. I mean, I mean, the, the, the team, yeah, the, te yeah. the team were there, yeah. And they still are, now, they still do it now. And, and so he was on the bars, rigid, and at the same position, the team got up there and sort of said, okay, <laughs> What are you? What are you afraid of? Where, where, where is the problem? I don't know, staff. Okay, let's break your long-term goal. Your long-term goal is you want to walk out with a marine beret and go and do a jumps course and become a reg guy. Yeah, yeah, I do. Right. Your medium-term goal is to get through P Company, right? Yeah. Right. Your short-term goal. Forget all that. Your short-term goal is to move your feet across this trinasium. Oh, right. Okay. Right. So what we're going to do is I just want you to move your left foot one centimeter. Ball, just one centimeter and the guy goes I, I, I don't know you can just just be present center everything move it one centimeter say so one centimeter right great now do that with your right foot right now move it an inch right good now move, and then before you know it whoosh, off he goes <laughs> and it's about breaking this inner chimp in our brain which says you know fear flight freeze and going actually that's a feeling, that's a thought. I'll accept that thought and I'll let it go. And, and, and I, will, I will not allow my brain to tell me that there is a mental block there that I cannot do something because actually, physically, I can. It's rationalizing, isn't it? Yeah, in a way. And it's training the brain as well that you know, when we're confronted by fear or that we don't want to do something, that actually we need to, we need to find a way of moving past that to train our brain to tell us that we can. Um, and so that really got me fired up in that space as to how can we bring this to the whole military? So when we join the military, we come from varied backgrounds. And I come from a, uh, an adoptive family, a broken home. I spent my, my formative years brought up in Africa, funnily enough. Um, and so I came to the table with a load of crap in a glass that was that, that that full excuse me and we then look at the glass and we we we, we some people come in with that much some people come in with that much and so the buffer until it overflows is variable and it, it's really about giving people tools at the start of their career and this is where i'm championing at the moment is to be able to go to atrs to the army um, uh, Foundation College at Har Harrogate to Sandhurst to Dartmouth to Cranwell and to give people the tools from day one when they join the military to help them be able to regulate that amount of crap that they have in the gl glass and that will be something that goes throughout life so that when they're in the firefight and that tension and stress starts filling that glass up they've got the tools to be able to go okay let me recenter myself here and on the task in hand and be able to deal with it and get through it and that is all scientifically proved it's not it's not it's nothing new 
been the, the thought process of that has been around for thousands of years you know buddhist mindfulness whatever it may be but it's really successful and suddenly now we have a we have a following of cohort of senior military officers that don't turn around and their default setting is but oh, it's all a load of rubbish get some moral fiber crack on it is more about we need to invest in our soldiers our, our, you know and our airmen and our sailors to be able to get them to do the job so that when they go into transition we're not fixed with you know veterans that are facing suicide um that are facing um mental health issues 10 years down the line the presentation is three to ten years but you know traditionally took me ten years to get mine um and that we're able even through service life transition and outside in a corporate environment that they have those tools to regulate themselves so they don't go over the edge long-winded answer to your question <laughs> good, good answer good answer um that brings me on to uh well you brought me brought me well on to um you talked earlier so you've been a witness on the defense select committee correct mm -hmm. um so by chance <clears throat> and it was purely coincidental there's a, a lady who um kate england was on the podcast before uh her husband <clears throat> i don't know if you listen to that one but her husband is a guy called james england james was well oh, i can't remember what unit it was it was qdg qdg uh so suffers from acute ptsd i met him when when she came when she came to the studio to do the podcast she was coming on because she just started a petition or or she even somewhere along after kicking off a petition to get the emo uh, not the emody the, the coroner whoever it is to record whether a suicide is a veteran or not you know, you know how you, how that goes about it, how the information is captured is another thing but that's what she did successfully um so it's helping to get that out of there um she came up with um so james came with her and they turned up the studio which is up in warwick mm. middle of nowhere so it's me sound engineer that's it he came up because he could he didn't want to be on his own she couldn't really live on his own um various reasons but a whole two hours he, he wouldn't get out of the car I, I she got out i he said hello and he stayed in the car i said hello that was it went in said he, you know there's a toilet here if he wants to come and use it he can come there's a room here on his own he can come and sit if he wants to come and use it didn't he sat in the car for two hours two hours um because he didn't feel comfortable coming in where there's people he didn't know even though it was just myself and him. we came out when we finished and we came out and that i found that really hard to struggle this i found it really hard really um hard in terms of emotion it was i found it quite uh upsetting um because who should whether you're a veteran or not whether you're a man or a woman no one should be in that state of mind where you have to get to that point where you, you feel that but i mean try to take his life twice as well before that um you should not have no human being should have to suffer like that you know um so when we came out he got out of the car and, and he shook my hand and he was very very nervous uh very uncomfortable um but that's a big step for him we i, I sort of tried to struck a, struck a conversation with him she did and then he went <clears throat> um but she she got in touch with me yesterday um and i there's a couple of emails i'm going to read them out i'm going to read them out because one to help her out and two because i want to come on to the veterans health side of things at the moment the the, the perceived crisis suicide crisis the perceived crisis that that got a lot of people up in arms mm -hmm. uh, right so to, some, to a certain extent right um but and i'll i'll read these as an example of because it explains where her kate situation is and what she's been trying to do with james which has now been going on for fucking years years so uh, um and right there's names and organizations in you um and, and so the, i'm not reading that to, to, to blame this, this it doesn't work like that but just as an example who's, who's been contacted and i should cover it with kate you know has had support along the way and james has had support along the way not enough no um i mean i know at the moment he is not in a good state um depression you know the acute PTSD. he's struggling out of bed he's not good at all and that is it's on the on fucking downward spiral pardon the language right so as an example dear sir i'm a wife of i'm a wife of a veteran of the first queen's dragoon guards he suffered a head injury in 2003 and left service in 2007 but was later diagnosed with severe chronic ptsd We've had a long journey which continues with our four young boys. 
I found within this, within this journey that there is little support to the effects of PTSD on people like me and our children. I am currently a member of the Ripple Pond, but that only goes so far. And there is the Hidden Wounds team at Help the Heroes. But again, this is only really limited. I'm an active campaigner within the Veteran PTSD Circle and started a petition last year to, to record veteran suicides so we have a better understanding of numbers committing suicide. And by pure chance, I started speaking to a research assistant from Combat Stress, Lucy Spencer Harper, in regard to our different skill set. I know, in regards to support and research into the effects of PTSD on partners and children. We came together and with our different skill set, we had a meeting with Robert Courts, MP, Armed Forces Champion in the House of Commons. And I've been advised by a journalist in the Daily Mail that Frank Francois would be agreeable to a meeting to talk about his subject with Robert Courts, but haven't heard anything and I wondered by chance by any chance you meet with Ripple Pond and other charities that you may that you would like to met, meet with myself to actually talk first time with someone about first hand experience of the system of the PTSD system uh, throughout this journey I've screamed for care for my husband after being turned down for services uh, oh, there's a few of their names but I won't name them um, terrible care under the, the local mental health team which apparently is being investigated by the parliamentary ombudsman. He's tried to commit suicide in 2014 and 2015, later section in 2017. Family's under huge stress with a system that fails the person suffering with PTSD, but the families that are left to pick up the pieces. Thank you for taking time to read the email. And then and she finishes it off. Now, one of the things I know after speaking to her, now she sent me that because she, 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 she's, she said, I need help. What, what can I do? Who, who, do you know who can I go to? What can I do? Um, and by chance, you come along. Hmm. Um, so I think I, just just one on it. Sorry, sorry, yeah, just, yeah, just yeah. one on it. One of the issues she's been facing, and this is off two or three organisations, and uh, you know some charities, some not, is that I know at least two of them. I've turned around and said, James's situation is too complex. We cannot deal with it. What, what's and that's just a, an example of where we're at, at the moment. What throw your thoughts at me? In fact, you were saying you've written a paper on this, have you not? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I have, yeah. So, sadly, it's an all too common situation. We have gone from, um, you know, the Myers study back in the end of the first world, beginning of the first world war, war, war identified as the first study that, that really looked at battle trauma or shell shock as not a sort of cowardice issue, but a mental health system. And, that then transpired through, and, and I'm, there's a reason why I'm saying this, that then transpired through to the Second World War where we had over 300 psycho, um, uh, uh, psychoanalysts, psychologists within the military. They were, they were trained, highly trained, you know, psycho, psychoanalysts within the military system because they realised at that stage, through the attrition of the First World War and the Second World War, that the mind played a serious um, part in what we do in battle some more than others we then went through this really fallow period of from the second world war where really nothing i mean one would argue northern ireland um but in terms of a, a, a proper combative battle um that the falklands was the next real interaction but we'd forgotten all the lessons from uh the second world war the first world war the psychiatrists had gone from the military pretty much. And we were left with, you know, Afghanistan and Iraq then coming up and people usually taking three or to ten years to display their signs of PTSD. So when people were, it was this trickle system, people thought, okay, this is not going to be a severe issue for us. We can deal with it from the system. Bring on Help for Heroes, bring on Combat Stress, bring on all of these charities who... You know, I think with all of these charities, there's been over 187 charities that have come up for mental health since the beginning of Afghanistan. All have been well-meaning. All have um, uh, had success, uh, some success along the way. But I guess where I'm coming from is that there is no, A, no centre of excellence for the treatment of mental health illness at the current time. We have with physical, and that was the, 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 the DM, um, Headley Court, that has now been subsumed into the D of the DNRC, the Defence National Rehabilitation Centre, which was part funded by the Duke of Westminster up at Stamford Hall, which is an incredible establishment. And the end part of that is the national side. So 
the the NHS input, the the the, the mental health input, the you know, um, and looking at those in Civvy Street that have suffered the same sort of problems that the, through trauma, some form of trauma, that whether it be blue light services, whether it be um, effects of a bombing, what you know, it, the, the the military people have, have, have um, um, sort of uh, um, experienced. And I'm coming to the point in a sec, but what I'm what I'm trying to say is all too often is that the charities are operate in a very stovepipe way. They're very protective over their funding. They're very protective over the governance and structure. Um, they have definitive lines of what they'll do. If you don't fit within those definitive lines, it almost as if the gyro goes tilt and it's like, we can't, we can't help you. Now, there's been over £910 million of LIBOR funding spent in the mental health arena. And we can only account for £48 million. Hang on. So, <clears throat> what type of funding? Like, sorry. So the bank fines. When the banks were doing their their good commercial stuff in two thousand and eight, and they were <laughs> fined by you know government. Yeah. Their fines went into a into a pot. That pot, it was declared by the chancellor at the time, George Osborne, would be used for military charities. And mm. over the years, there was no. The problem with it was, was well, there was no real bidding process for libel fund. So if you were an MP and you were mates with George Osborne, you could lobby him in the parliament, uh, you know, in the annals, in the sort of, you know, lobby of parliament and go, George, look, here's a good case. Right, write me a letter, write a letter in. And he'd go, yeah, I support that. And that was the funding structure of the LIBOR fund to a degree. Of which almost a billion pounds is raised. Of almost a billion. And yeah, how much is... Almost a billion pounds went to military charities. Yeah, uh, and on mental health. It went to military yeah. charities. And how much of that is accounted for? 48 million. Where's the rest? Well, so I'll give you an example, right? So I set up a, um, a military helpline for Samaritans and funded it with three million pounds. And a lot of that, well, all of it actually came from <coughs> LIBOR, the LIBOR fund. Um, but we knew what it exactly was we wanted to do with it, how to spend it, how to account for it, and what every penny meant. The problem was was that the LIBOR funds were so big they had to get them they wanted to make a difference and get it out that people were bidding for it without any real knowledge of how they were going to spend it. Yeah. So all of a sudden you had charities that would get two million quid and were going, uh, what 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 do we do with this? Well let's let's hire some more people. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um well uh let's build some holiday houses. Yeah, even better. You know, and it was it wasn't all done in a joined up manner. If you had had a veteran strategy that had a 10 year horizon, and on a 10 year rolling horizon, I mean, that was part of a, a top co organization, be it a veterans administration, be it a, a DNRC. Like the USA have got. Like the USA. Yeah. And it's not perfect, by the way. But you, you can then uh, be able to isolate the people that are the highest risk of suicide, PTSD, to stabilize them, to then for that organization to point and shoot at the relevant charity that does have the expertise to deal with it, we, I would argue, wouldn't quite be in the situation that we are in now. Now, the issue that we have is that if we bring in the training of what I was talking about earlier to the, to the people who join the military at the early stages, that should equip them throughout their whole life transition and veteran side. It won't catch all of them, excuse me, but it'll enable them to, to, to be more aware of the issues that they're coming under. The problem we have, obviously, is the people that have transitioned and the veterans, the 66,000 veterans, that are somewhere in the ether that we don't know the information I'm of. Yeah. Um, and I think... The problem there is, is that we will always come, and I have it on a daily basis, where people say, well, what's happening to veterans? What's happening with this? You're not doing that. You're not doing that. And I'm having to, to sort of say, okay, look, the message has been heard, and I can look you in the eye, and I can say on this podcast, as a veteran, the message has been heard, and that things are trying to be put in place so that we can have the first stage platform of that for those that are in service now and transitioning that when it works we can then involve those that are out there on the veteran side to make sure that it works 
you know, and, and there, is, there are platforms in place for them to come to. Now, that's going to take time. It's going to take buy-in. You know, I will always face, the argument I always face is, well, the, the government doesn't care. The MOD um, is morally um, uh, out of kilter and the NHS is bankrupt. We can, we can carry on slagging off organisations or we can sit down and try and bring collaboration and make a difference, putting in a structure that is a proper strategy rather than, you know, and I'm going to say it, a veterans paper which really is light on, um, on doing things and heavy on saying things. It's a typical political paper. Now, going to the Defence Select Committee was an opportunity to, to, to stand up and be counted effectively and go, look, this is my experience. This is what you can learn from it. I've mentored over 35 people with PTSD, ranging from private soldier to three-star general. Um, it doesn't care what rank you are. It doesn't care what regiment you are. It doesn't care whether you're black, white, Indian, you know, Nepali. It doesn't, it doesn't care. But we have to get the system better. And that is a ground up approach and is about getting parliament on side. It is about getting MOD involved and NHS. Now, in the short time that I've been doing And the this, charities. Yeah, and the ch sorry, yeah, very good point. Yeah, and the charities. Um, and the thing about it is, is that the charities are, are, are finding it difficult in some degree you have the smaller charities so for instance your case i don't know if they've been to see ptsd resolution a a fantastic little charity that hardly anyone knows about with a huge success rate of treating people with ptsd I'm gonna write that down you keep talking um you know we've got veterans first in the northeast um run by tony wright um we've got you know so there are li there are lots of little centers of expertise why can we not bring these together for the force, you know, the force of good? A lot of them are regional, um, but why can we not bring them together? So I guess the aim of the Defence Select Committee and then my subsequent appointment as Defence Advisor to the Mindfulness APPG in Parliament was to look at how we actually can do this. And Marc Francois, who was mentioned in that email, um, I've been to see he's very passionate about it you know he's, he's very marmite guy you either love him or you hate him but um he's very passionate about um about this idea of using the dnrc <coughs> as a center of excellence not only for research but for treatment um but also to spread the word nationally and internationally about how we develop a strategy for our veterans and how we treat our veterans that are currently falling short of the system now the other issue we have is that Sometimes these veterans don't want anything to do with the military. They don't want to step inside a military establishment, be it a silly military establishment or, or, or an establishment. And I think Liz Murray would have alluded to that when she was on, because I know she feels that way as well. But I think that um, there, is, there is the ability, we just need the ability for there to be one centre that collates data on um, veterans and who they are, electronic um, tagging as they leave the military and also somewhere where they can be centrally come to if they are in deep stress and deep um, you know deep crisis um, and I think that the problem with the charity sector is that it's too diverse in what it does there are too many charities doing the same thing it's very confusing and so people just tend to turn around and say well I don't know where to go um, and actually if I go there then I'm not you know, I'll probably get turned away, and so they don't bother, and then they get to crisis stage, and then they, you know, have a have an event. So it, it's it's really difficult when you hear situations like you've just raised, where the sector is falling way short in its responsibility in helping. Um, that it's a prime example of one of these veterans that is in the uh, in between the you know the, t the the sort of two nirvanas if you like um and and it's uh, you know doesn't can't get help from either side um and that's that's the the issue that we are uh struggling with at the moment is what goes in place because dnrc when it's done will take in veterans so is that being is that a 
a physical building. The NRC? Yeah. It's huge. It's, it's, I've it's, never it's, heard of it, mate. So it's, um, if you Google it, it's, um, it's, it's Stamford Hall up in, near Leicester. Okay. So Duke of Westminster bought basically an old stately home, as you do. And um, uh, you would know, sir. There was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish. Um, there was basically a three hundred million pound project to build uh, the state of the art facilities in treating a rehabilitation for uh, physical injuries and also uh, mental health side. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, another another sort of areas. Um, Headley Court shut now. Headley Court shut. It's, so it's gone up to to DNRC. Uh, um, going back, I mean that like I, I highlighted it before. I read, read for the email the, the people and organisations mentioned in there that the, the short the shortcomings that veterans face, and yeah, well, yeah, that veterans face um, from the mental health aspect. It's not attributable to any one organisation, any one person. It's a it's the system is not working. Um, it is not evolved to where it needs to be. Um, one would argue, what is the system? Absolutely, there is um, one. Absolutely. So, so my, so I didn't know about the VA. I always call it the Veterans Association. Obviously, it's the Veterans Administration. I didn't know about the VA until Kate mentioned it on the podcast. Yeah. Uh, and then to me, I think, well, that, that would bloody work because it's coordination, <clears throat> like you're saying, it's electronically tagging or, or digitally tagging a veteran when they leave. It's when they enter this, they can enter the system at any point, any point. So I walk myself into Help the Heroes, which I did. Yeah. Um, I walk in there, and I'm at that point. I am, my am onto the VA system, so there I, I'm, I'm captured. There is a single point. But there's a stage captured. before that. So with, with with tills tills, which is you know the transition intervention and liaison service, which is being put in place by the NHS, supported by the military, which is as you come up to leaving, your your MO uh, or your unit will physically. Find you will find a, a GP that you want to go to. They will agree to take you on. Your unit will physically liaise with that GP and say, "Here are the ongoing issues with Trooper So and So." You know, here are his medical records. Um, and then what they will do is they will then almost indemnify you for a period of time after you leave to have access to the military um, uh, system to enable you to complete any courses of medicine or anything that you've that you've had as you're coming up to leave. But what it means is, is that not only do you tag yourself on the NHS system as a veteran, which should, in theory, mean you get priority service. It means that your medical records are handed over. So, you know, some people, when they leave, they don't register with a GP. So they fall between the cracks. So there's no follow-up, there's no data available for us to go out there and say, okay, you are really suffering with PTSD. How are you now? You know, is there anything we should be doing? But it also means that they get then implanted onto a um, a veteran system that tags them. Um, now, that's great. Some people don't. Some people, the last thing they want, as I've said, when they leave the military, is to have any more contact and feeling that they're tugged by the military. But the GP selection bit is really important because it means that um, they, they have a first point of call, and GPs more and more now are being. Uh, trained in uh, the requirements of veterans as they come out. Previously, that wasn't massive. We we, we spoke about that that sort of capturing the, the doc side of things. And the only issue you can see what you're saying there is 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 the human factor where you've got to rely on actions from the 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 the, the guy or girl who's getting out. Go and find a GP, identify it, and do the docs. When what I had in my head was. Look, if those their records within the MOD, I would I'd imagine surely these days they're digitizing them, they're scanning them in there online. So why can't why can't they just get digitally transferred to the NHS and the NHS holds the records and then and and, and that's a reference point without any need from the from the veteran to go and find a GP, come back, give the GP's details to the MO and you know GDPR data protection, right? So so. If, 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 <laughs> I've heard that a few times as well, <laughs> but I, I think that if you if you um, uh, basically <clears throat> there, sh there shouldn't if you make it a requirement of your exiting procedure as you leave the military. So instead of the, the good old days that we know, which is give me your ID card, cut it up in front of your eyes, and 
you know, and there's the door. Thanks a lot. Don't come back in. It is more a case now of, um, okay, a, a, a much more rigid procedure around, okay, have, you know, you need to tick the doctor's box before you leave. You need to tick that box. This that, the, the ongoing treatment, you know, support before you can be discharged from the army. And frankly, that should have been done years ago. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get to a stage, and not everyone want it, but if we could get to a stage where people can have a psych evaluation before they leave, not in a sort of, you know, um, but in, in a, a sort of comforting way for themselves, that they can as well. And by the way, we're talking about veterans and serving personnel here. There's the families to consider as well. You know, and, and actually, interestingly, um, I'm a, um, a trustee of a cocktail fund up at Hereford, which is the charity for the serving guys um, at Hereford. And there are guys there that are doing, you know, 20 years service. Um, and they've been away for six or seven years of that 20 years. I mean, physically away. And the families are, are you know, are struggling, you know, in terms of, in terms of their ability to, um, to address the, that, that attrition and that action that their, their husbands and wives go on. It's very difficult for them. So we have to think about the families and, and how we get them together and how we give them coping mechanisms to deal with what they need to deal with. So when, as Liz, that there, Kate. Sorry, Kate. Forgive me. Um, Kate said about James, is that you know she can recognise those early signs of her husband in an unusual situation that she can flag that then hopefully we can catch before it becomes a full blown issue um, that unfortunately he's now in, and you know that is all part of this rich tapestry that I'm sort of. Um, running into dealing with and and addressing but i've been gobsmacked about how defensive a lot of organizations are in 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 wanting to collaborate and come together for the greater good well if, uh, organizations and charities right you include those in that yeah, yeah. i mean uh they get uh, charities get dragged across the coals a lot of the time no very much so since uh i don't know uh what's the word outrage news outrage media you know um uh, because they're not seen to be spending the money correctly i mean health here was the prime example the, the first the first big the first uh not a sort of major one that was you know where's all the fucking money going um and the kind of the kind of areas that i don't want to have a tangent here but the kind of areas that the money is best spent, I think, when you talk about mental health, it's very difficult to to measure what the sort of return on investment of that money is, how successful that money is, what it is. Because getting mental health treatment, giving a you know paying for a, a veteran to go and get go into a course of counselling, for example, um, it it it's not it. it you don't go in with an issue and then the end of the counselling come out and it's fixed. So a charity can't turn around and go, you know, we spent X amount of million on this this area and and we got these results because you can't how you can't really quantify the results. So the only things they can they can they can they end they end up throwing their money at things, I think. Um at things where that sort of calms down the public outcry. This is what happened with help for heroes, I think. Calms down the public outcry. Look, we spent this amount of money on we give this money to veterans laptops but i know a mate who got a it wasn't ptsd right but he got fucking hell the kit he's been that's my help the heroes the kit he's been given thrown at him laptop bike golf clubs and expensive not cheap expensive stuff great it's great it's great getting free stuff but it's not what it's not what fixes you but it's that rush to get rid of the money because the other thing is bad seen as bad is sitting on a load of cash it's like a really short sighted way of looking at business because it's business, all right? It, it, it's it, except that you're trying to earn money to spend it on charitable causes as opposed to earn money to give it to your shareholders, right? 
Um, but going back to I don't know, like tangent there. Going back to uh, I don't know what, what do you think about any of that? What I'm saying there. Well, Just, going back to what I said before, isn't it? It's it's this 910 million pounds of libel funding yeah. of which 48 yeah. million is accountable. Yeah. You know the charities are in a position where they have to, you know, they have to spend the money. They can't sit on global reserves of 78 million pounds because the charity commission will be on their back. But at the same time, what have they got in place to be able to spend whatever million yeah. on? It's definitely between a rock and a hard place. So what you were saying is about you know, the, the the lack of willingness to collaborate, and and that comes down to again, money and money and money with the main one, I suppose, and pride individual level and. I don't know. Uh, distrust in the other organisations have been asked to collaborate with. All, in, all of the three. Yeah, all of the three. And if, you know, what you're talking about there is going down a new path, trying to create a better system. And the the the, the worry and the risk is attributed with making a bold new step for a charity to take to try and get in line with the system when it could, not 100% sure it's going to be the right way to go and getting dragged across the coals again. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are some strategic charities out there, generally some of them are the smaller ones, that are willing to cooperate, they're willing to give their information across, they're willing to work together, but the problem is is that a lot of them are fearful that if they do that, they'll lose their recognition, they'll lose their brand, they'll lose um, what they stand for. Um, but who cares, Tim? Well, it's for the greater good, who cares? If they still generate the money, and 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 if they're still if they're able to be part of an organization, or organizations, or a system that is able to continue generating the money, they're still a productive part of it, and they lose their recognition with it. it, it really, who cares? It's not about, yeah. I mean, you know, it's not about recognition, is it? I'm doing a good thing. Whether you get recognized or not, it's a second thought. Yeah, no, I'm talking about brand recognition. So, you, you, sorry, you, sorry. You're preaching to convert it. So, there is an organization called COPCO, which is Confederation. I wasn't going to go at you then. I'm just. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, you know, Corpsio is Confederation of Charities. Um, and but you look, they have a permanent membership, and then they have an affiliate membership, and then they, you know, they have people to join. The permanent membership is the big charities, it's RBL, it's the Army Benevolent Fund, it's, it's the big organizations. And so, their mindset under, under General John McCall, who's the, the boss of it, is very much to try and get this collaboration going, but. Everyone else is so skeptical about collaboration, about it working, and about how it goes. When you see, you know, the top ten of the who's who of military charities there, that they go, well, what, what impact a small charity like me going to make here? And so they just get on and do their own thing, and they'll do their own thing in isolation. They'll do, you know, they'll do things which are really great, but you know, probably, well, you know, Kate won't have heard of them. So it's. It, it is it is sometimes better to go to the smaller organizations than it is to the bigger ones but in that case you know i think that there is a responsibility for the cpm teams the cmts that you know the the mental health teams to really get involved there under the armed forces covenant and under what the nhs says that it was doing to prioritize veterans and if that is failing which it clearly excuse me clearly is then you know the questions need to be asked as to why that's the case. Yeah, the covenant. It'd be nice if um, it'd be nice if it was more. It was if it was better worded and people could be held accountable for signing up to it, not doing what they say they're going to do. And oh, that, that's a different conversation altogether. Um, yeah, well, if, uh, yeah, that is a different conversation. That's going to go rant. I mean, Let's my, leave my, that one. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I mean, um, yeah, I. I mean, my experience of it is, uh, I, if I had been a different person, I may not be here now. Uh, in terms of, because I went to help, I ended up help heroes, then and, and the uh, over the NHS, then with two or three other organisations, private and uh, yeah, so ca like council and stuff like that. And there was a point where. I didn't know who I was supposed to be talking to. I didn't know who was supposed to be talking to me. I didn't know if I was waiting for an action, for me to do an action or them to do something. Uh, then a little bit of counselling finished and then nothing. And then so, but because as the journey's gone on for me, I, uh, I'm much more aware of 
I'm, I'm in a better place because of it mentally. So, and when you're in a better place, you're more proactive, and I, I understand it more. I've sort of immersed myself in the, in the mental health side of things, um, you know, psychology stuff like that. Uh, as, oh, as much intelligent parent. as 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 I can say, as much <laughs> as much as much immersion as a power edge guy can do. <laughs> I saw a picture book about uh, about mental well being. <laughs> uh, thanks for that, buddy. <laughs> um, yeah, so I I made myself get in touch with them because otherwise it's going to go pear shaped again. Because I'd gone through a cycle of sort of getting back on track, thinking yeah yeah I'm fine, and then poof, down the pan again, even deeper into the pan than before. Um, uh, but again, it's that disjointedness. Uh, I do think the VA is the way forward, that or, or something like that. Um, because I think also, if we had like a Veterans Administration type of thing, that is also the path of least resistance for reform. It wouldn't really take. Uh, it, it'd be fucking difficult, mind. But money, really? Yeah, yeah, it'd be really expensive. But okay, why is that? Well, it's just it's just the attribution of money to run it and to and to make it work. So in America, I forget the figure. I mean, it's 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 comparing apples with pears, right? Because America is about 90 million times the size mm. of UK. But, you know, it, it does cost a lot of run when you add in Walter Reed, you know, hospital facility, you add in, you know, everything that they've got there. But you you touch on a really interesting point, which I just want to highlight. And that is, for anyone who is suffering, the outcome of having been through the journey, nine times out of 10, can turn you into a much stronger more resilient person and it's difficult to know that at the time but when you're sat having come through the other end of it where you've been in the dark places as i have you have it, it, it's 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 easier to look back and go okay you know the answer is not to 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 take one's own life although you know that can be the the, the darkest pit that most you know a lot of people can be in um so I think that there is no one there's no one exacting answer because you're always going to have people that are going to think a VA idea is bad. You're going to have people who think the DNRC idea is brilliant. You're going to have people that think collaboration is bad. You're going to have people that think collaboration is good. But I think it does require somebody to stand up and go, right, I don't, whatever, there, there has to be something put in place. And we're going to put this in place because it's the most sensible, it stands the most scrutiny, Financially, it's viable, and it can really work. And then, do you know what? After three years, if it's not working, we'll tweak it, or we'll, you know, we'll alter it until we have got the best setup. But the problem at the moment is that nobody is striving forward and going right, bang, lead from the front. This is what we're going to do. So the veterans out there are left in this position of being confused, not knowing who to turn uh, to, turn to, and are being um, left out the system. And then you have a situation where the, there is a self-perpetuation of negativity around what we could do with veterans and serving personnel. And as long as that negativity is allowed to reign, we'll never get anything done. It's, yeah, I, I see some craziness online with it. Craziness online, people saying boycott, boycott. Certain, some of them are saying that before Christmas, boycott. I think it's the Poppy Legion, boycott them. We do, Thinking what what's in your head? What are you talking about? You know, um, it, it's just, it's it's craziness. John, I'm just when I was walking up to the studio, John. I follow Johnny Mercer on Twitter. I'm not conservative, I'm not Labour. But I met Johnny and you meet people. I like him. He's good. He's an honest guy. You know, um, yeah, as honest as politicians can be. <laughs> Sorry, you, you said it, not me. <laughs> right. He there's a tweet gone out. We got retweeted, and it's to do with veterans. I'm going to check it up now. It was asking to fill in the survey. I'm going to see what it is and see if you're aware of it. It's a recent one. Say again. Is this a recent one? Is this the King's Today? College London? Just I don't know. Survey which I no idea. Retweeted Maybe. to him to say, "Can you make it?" Mm. Have a look. Yeah, I'll have a look now. Right. What was the name of just while I'm doing this? What was the name of? And oh, I've got it. Hang Imagine on. survey. It's called. Got it. Right. It was. Johnny Mercer retweeted it. It was tweeted by Lieutenant General Richard Nuji. Yeah, Chief Defence Personnel, yeah. Yeah, the strategy for our veterans supports those who have served with the UK, consult the UK consultation paper guiding how the strategy can be introduced across the UK, except for devolved matters. To have your say, complete a survey by 21st of Feb. Are you aware of this? Go on then. What, what well, it's, 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 it's another addendum to the veteran strategy, which came out, which I said was heavy on words and light on, okay. on, on promises. You know, the MOD is in a really difficult place. The MOD 
you know, General Nuji is, is really trying hard to change the way <clears throat> our people are treated and how they leave. And that is not only the, the serving personnel, it's the families as well, and, and how we deal with veterans. The problem is, is he gets sniped from every rooftop that, you know, that he goes to. So he's in a difficult position. And I'm not a, I'm not a governmentite. I'm not a military. I, I'm, not, I'm a veteran. I'm just like you. I'm like everyone else out there. But I guess I can be, uh, because I'm apolitical, because I, you know, I've seen how government works, I've seen how the MOD works, I've seen how NHS works, is that I can, I can stand back and go, okay, is he making the best of this? And the answer is yes, I think he, I think he absolutely is. The message is lost along the line. So when you look at veteran survey, you know, all a veteran looks at and goes, oh, God, another PR stunt, you know, another political thing. What difference is it going to make? You know, what, what impact am I going to have? And this is the this is what I come back to negativity. This is the attitude we need to change. Mm. Um, and actually, it is the more um, prosaic treatments that are that are that are coming to the fore. So, you know, when I, instance, when I went through CBT, um, I was in front of a twenty-seven-year-old girl who sat me down and said, "Right, okay, um, you know, Tim, would you like to tell me about your experiences of that you, you know." And I was there talking about ethnic cleansing in Bosnia. I was talking about helicopter incidents. I was talking about, you know, um, Iraq. I was talking about Scud missiles going on. I was talking about, yeah, I was talking about a whole gamut of stuff. And she was in tears within within fifteen minutes. The counsellor. Yeah. So there is this role reversal about you know me counselling the counsellor, <laughs> and then you go through EMDR, eye movement desensitisation reprocessing, which is his ability to. I heard of this. Yeah. Nick Goldsmith we mentioned that. And it's, you know, it works very well for a single trauma, not so much for multiple traumas. And then I found mind mindfulness. So I'm a trustee of the Oxford University Mindfulness Centre. And it's evidence-based. It's not new. It's been around for 3,000 3, years. But it basically, it's, it's centering the mind, body, and soul in the present moment. You know, you cannot change the past. Whatever you have done, whatever you have said, whatever you've seen, whatever, you cannot change the past. You cannot predict the future. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You can make plans. You can say, I'm going to go and see you know, my wife or my, my uh, girlfriend, my parents, whatever. But tomorrow may come and things may derail that plan. So why worry? Why expend 70% of our brain's energy on what we did in the past, what we're doing in the future? Concentrate on today, living today and being who you are. And it, 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 it's, it's, you try and take that into um, the Marines or the Paris. I mean, I took it into um, to Hereford, and uh, I'm not betraying any trust when I say this, is that um, I had dinner um, with the CO, um, squadron commander, and various other, um, some new lads in one of the squadrons. And one of them came from a regiment, um, was 25 years old, had um, three kids, um, all below the age of six. Uh, and then there were two other guys who came from other units. Um, um, and they were probably... 26 25 26 and they'd just gone through um continuation training they were just done you know all the stuff they were doing and i sat down to dinner with them and i thought right i'm going to really interrogate them as to um what what it is they know about alternative treatments for um you know for for, for anxiety depression or panic um and, and they were the ones they turned to me you know and said oh well we've been reading this book about mindfulness have you heard about mindfulness you know about you know how the, and they not only were they talking to me about the, uh, the 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 sort of the the form of mindfulness they were going into the research based evidence around it so we're now growing you know i, I refuse to believe that the the some of the senior officers who say you know well stop calling it mindfulness because the toms won't they won't won't go for it i have not met anyone that hasn't grasped the concept that wants to learn about it because they realize that if they put something in place in their own practice for five minutes a day of their lives, that you know what they're seeing at the you know arse end of everything may not happen to them. So it could be mindfulness, it could be um, Explain mindfulness. Explain mindfulness. just define it. So basically, as I say, the, the art of mindfulness is about um, uh, making yourself present in the moment by mind, body, and soul. So it's not it's being non-judgmental so whatever you're feeling so if we're sat here now 
you probably in your mind have got other things going on about do I need to stop off at the shops at the way back? Do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? Do whatever. What I'm is, focused on you, Tim. 100%. Well, well so you should be. <laughs> um, but also now you're bullshitting. <laughs> so um, it, it is about um, the simplistic way of doing it with it is, <clears throat> and I learned this when I, I started having anxiety and, and, and panic. And, and the first time, it's quite com- comical now, but it wasn't at the time. The first time I got uh, an anxiety or panic attack, I was flying on my own. Oh, God. And I was, I was in this helicopter and I'd just taken off. And all of a sudden, um, I, felt, I felt my hands getting really clammy. Is that a civvy? Yeah. Yeah. And I felt my hands getting really clammy. And I was like, what's going on? And then I felt my heart was, was really painful here. No trigger. No. So my brain was then going, you're having a heart attack. You're having a heart attack. So I was then going, I'm having a heart attack. So then my carbon dioxide levels were building. My heart was going faster. My hands were really sweaty by this stage. And all of the time, I was flying at 500 feet between you know south of england and, and middle england going oh, i really don't know what to do but because i was stuck in that hel- if i hadn't been stuck in that helicopter i'd have probably gone off the rails but because i was stuck in that helicopter i had i had to fly there was no way out and what it did was was that the brain took me through it and out the other side and i, and I remember going what the hell was that about and now when I learned about mindfulness and mindfulness techniques, and I learned about that fear, fear is false evidence appearing real. It's our brain telling us that we are fearing something when we don't necessarily need to be fearing it. So what prime example of that is, you know, I'm having a heart attack. The brain is telling you you're having a heart attack because your heart is beating faster. Well, the reason your heart is beating faster is because you released adrenaline. It's not because you're having a heart attack. So it's about mindfulness. Coming back to mindfulness, what that is in that situation is, okay, I, I feel my heart is going faster now. That's, that's fine. I'm not going to die. I know I'm not going to die because I know that this is just anxiety. So let it go. And what we do is we turn around to our brain in that process and say, do what you want. Try and keep, convince me that I'm dying, but I'm not going to accept it. And so the brain turns around and goes, Oh, this is no fun anymore. You know, you used to be rolling around on the floor and calling ambulances in an A&E, which happened to me twice. Um, you know, you're not playing the game anymore, so now I'm just going to I'm going to behave. And in a in a really simplistic way, that's how mindfulness can help. So what we do is at the start of every day, no matter what issues we've got, we ground ourselves in the present moment for that day and just try and accept all the thoughts that are going through our mind and just let them let them go. And as we do that, it really then gets us to a position where the brain is relearned in what it in what in what it tries to tell us. You know, being in mind, it's the most powerful organ within the body, and we can you know w- we can be in a better position for it. And within two weeks of my PTSD, the the, the anxiety, the panic, that sort of sem- semi depression stage had, had disappeared. It. it there's a great book called Mindfulness in a Frantic World um, by Danny Penman and Mark Williams. And I've given out over 100 copies of that book. And over 100 copies of that book, and I, 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 I'm not lying to you, um, the feedback that I've got is that it's gone from everywhere from literally saving people's lives right the way through to um, I now have a tool to manage my anxiety and panic because I understand it and I understand what it means. Um, it's not the panacea, it's not the fix-all, um, but it, it, it seems to work for a, a huge majority of people. And we're now taking it into schools with children and it works with them, with all the bullying, social media, you know, all of that stuff as a parent you're really paranoid about. But it's also now going to be rolled out within the armed forces as well. The book. No, or, or the, the mindfulness, mindfulness, sorry, yeah, mindfulness, as a, yeah. As, as a practice. Well, um, it's interesting that, you, that what you say there, um, uh, the presentation of, sim- like your example of anxiety uh, and panic, um, and it, uh, but what sort of fixed that or alleviated the issue was not um, not learning what to do when that ha- that that happens training exercising the, and mind in a different area 
at a different time when nothing's happening because it, it, it'll it, and that'll help solve the issue like your five minutes in the morning uh, i like i can liken that to an experience i had last year gone on for a while uh i say a while it was a while it was weeks which was it felt like a while it was horrendous <clears throat> um i was having a what well, i described now as an existential crisis which a lot of people go through whether they realize they're doing it or not ex-military um What's the point? What literally was what? What? What is the point of life? What? What is the point of me being here? Um, uh, if and I'm um atheist, so I have like a, a running gag in my head that I thought of years ago when I wasn't having any issues. And the gag is try convincing an atheist not to commit suicide because what's he got to fucking lose or she? You know, it's <laughs> as if they're going through you know uh, uh, bad times. Um. And I was having that existential crisis. Why am I here? What, what's what's the point? I didn't understand it. What, why should I bother going on? Um, and uh, in fact, going back again to saying if I wasn't, if I was a different person, I may not be here. A lot of that was down. Uh, that was a lot down to not just my own uh, um, sort of emotional awareness, um, emotional intelligence with it, but I'm very fortunate. Other people around me that. I'm being a circle of friends and ex colleagues. We've seen the impacts of uh, poor mental health, so we're all sort of look out for each other a bit more. And people look out for me, and and I was able to move through it like that. But this existential sort of crisis we're going through, and and it was what's the what's the what's the meaning of life? Why we? Uh, I was reading the book Jordan Peterson Twelve Rules for Life, which I'm guessing you've read. Yeah. Right. And uh, I was listening to it on Audible because I didn't have the concentration situation span to read. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so and there was he comes on to a bit in there's a bit in, oh, there's various bits in the book and he's yeah that question comes up and it's you're trying to overhood overcome um drama over overcome difficult times and what what what's useful to do and you this you people hear this a million times you break it down into little tasks and just try and achieve something whatever your issue may be it could be anything oh i'm fucking stressed out well you break it down a little task and just trying to achieve something and he goes further on to say and just trying to try to do something to feel good do something that makes you happy. However small that is, do something that is a positive thing that you know you should be doing. It doesn't make you necessarily make you happy. Um, make your bed in the morning is a classic of, of his, right? Um, uh, because you can't, he said, you you cannot define your own purpose. You cannot define your purpose in life, which is what I was trying to do. Um, this is one of the reasons the podcast came about. Because if I do that, if I do the podcast, and I have conversations with people like yourself, Tim, people like Kate, people like... Um, Brian Tuff. <laughs> it'll help people and that'll be me helping giving back to the community giving back to my mates and helping them out and that'll give me a sense of purpose did it I didn't do it mm-hmm. because you can't define your own which is what Jordan Peter says but what you can do is you can try and improve your mental state mm-hmm. which is what I thought that resonated with me I thought okay, I kind of understand that you can't define it because then it's it's false then it's not intrinsic an intrinsic ge- intrinsic generated purpose in life I understood that. So I started doing those things. Literally, make your bed. Oh, I've been making bed for, year, for fucking years. Make your bed. You know, doing the little things that you jack on. Instead of chucking my flipping dirty clothes on the floor, put them in the basket. Things I did when I was as a kid went by the wayside. And within, within a week, within a week, I almost had an epiphany. I was, that question that I'd, I'd been, it destroyed me for, for weeks. I was down the pan with alcohol, um, real not good at all. Um, and it disappeared. The question disappeared. I didn't notice the question disappear because when something goes like that, you don't notice it. You just, until a uh, retrospect. And I, when I realised it, I thought, well, the question's gone. But, but I haven't got, I don't, I haven't got, a pur- it's not like I've got a purpose now. I don't think, but the question's gone. I feel fucking good. Mm. And all I've done is I'm just, Little things, making positive changes, doing doing things positively, being a little bit a little more uh, physical exercise, making sure I take ten minutes off the gas pedal, half an hour off the gas pedal from work, from phone, from whatever, even in the bath, and and you know, I'll have a podcast on or I'll just stick some music on, and then stepping back. So in in not trying to identify the purpose, but doing positive things, it eliminated the question. 
eliminated in my head what what and why am I here which led me to maybe the maybe the the uh the meaning of life and the purpose of our existence to is to feel good feel happy feel positive and it's that simple mm. and that's what it is that's what it is for me there is no question it disappears if you if you try and better yourself there's a brilliant speech by do you know who william mcraven is no i don't know. so william mcraven was the um is a seal team um admiral who was um head of uh, basically um soft for the for the americans and he led the raid on obl that took out obl um, as I've been Laden uh, under Osama's administration. Um, 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 Osama. Oh, wow, that's wrong. Osama. <laughs> <laughs> Osama. Freud Obama. slip. Whoops. Um, <laughs> under Obama's administration. And um, he had a speech, and you can Google it and it, uh, on YouTube, and it's called the Make the Bed speech. What's it called? The Make the Bed the speech. The Make the Bed speech. And what he says, and he was addressing a university graduation um, uh and the speech is t- 15 minutes long. Um, but what the first thing he starts off is, you know, you will lead your life. You will come across, you'll come across um, danger. You will come across hardship. You will come across, you know, untold things that you will never want to see. So you have to train your mind and your body to deal with those things. And the first thing we do is we do something, one thing a day that makes us feel good. And the first thing of that day is we make our bed. And everyone's looking at him going, what are you on about? And then he goes on to, as SEAL team operators, we train with each other, we're buddy-buddy, we're friends, whatever. But you know, if everything else goes wrong, we know at the end of the day, when we've had a really shit day, we're coming back to a nice, clean, made bed. And that resets the mind, it resets us. You walk in, whatever shit in the past has happened, you go, there's my bed. Back to order. Back to order. And it is a really powerful presentational speech. So to any of the listeners out there, go Google William McRaven and make the bed speech. I'll um, find that. I'll post it. Yeah, yeah. It, is, it is fantastic. But you're absolutely right. Life, when we look at it, the purpose of life, one of those existential questions isn't it but you know i think we can always find a reason why we need to be for me it was my daughter it was my you know it was it was you know her growing up it was it was all of those that, that sort of thing and that was part of the, I mean, and that was part of the reasoning with you know one of my good friends here in london uh two of them um was when i you know and it was like crisis crisis and i was sat in front of them um after we persuaded to go to them, and it was all well, one of those one of those examples was, we you go, I've got two daughters, you, you girls. But when I, that state of mind I was in, and 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 when you get this that, in a certain situation, it was well, yeah, I understand that. But what then? They're not always going to need me. Which you know, it's you, you almost reason yourself out of the solution. It's weird. It's weird. It's weird. Anyway. Um, Anyway, I'm finding all this um, sort of mental health stuff quite heavy. Is there anything else you want? Well, no, mate. To be honest, <laughs> I, 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 I could talk. I could talk all day to you about it. I, I could actually talk all day to you about it. It's a, it's a it, unfortunately, it's a fascinating subject. It is. It, it, uh, you know, I was being I, I, slightly flippant, but yeah. yeah no, I, I, I wish it. I wish it. I wish it wasn't a subject at all, really. Um, but how much? Uh, how much? Danger have you faced flying uh, members of Pink Floyd around in your helicopter? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big well, Pink Floyd I, fan, mate. I'm a big Pink <laughs> Floyd fan. I think it's interesting. So both Nick and, and his wife Annette fly. They're both qualified pilots. And Nick's got about, I suppose, about 1,500 hours. Um, and Annette's probably got about 2,000. Annette's got a very good set of hands on her. She's a good, she's a good pilot. Um, but she, um, she leaves everything to the last minute, put it that way. Um, I think the first flight I did with her, which was as a military pilot, you, you might understand the irony of this, is that um, I got asked to fly with her from um, somewhere in England to an event. And um, it's the first time I met her, so it was like, you know, I thought I'd, I'd do the pucker thing, I'll stand outside the front, I'll make sure the seats are clean, I'll put the seat belts off so she can just jump in and all that sort of stuff. And she said, oh, you must be Tim. I said, yes, I am. I'm Annette. No, that's fine. Hi. So we got in and I sort of said, right, okay. Um, uh, this is the emergencies brief. If anyone gets you. Oh, yeah, don't worry about that. 
Yeah, we don't, don't worry about emergency speed. I was like, mm, okay. I'll tell you what, I'll just do it in my own head so I know what's going on. <laughs> but then we got airborne and I thought, fine, yeah, I could take off and everything else. And then she put in the autopilot and then she gets a handbag off the back, puts it between her feet in the pedal runs and, and then starts doing her makeup. <laughs> oh my God. In the helicopter. And I was like, didn't they get autopilot in helicopters? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did not know that. Oh, yeah. Or most of the military ones, and um, and uh, so we had a little conversation about that. But actually, it's been a joy. I, I mean, I've done it for ten years now. How did you get into that, mate? It's like the alias chauffeur job in the world, <laughs> helicopter chauffeur. <laughs> it's, it's got some good kickbacks. Um, so um, <laughs> I can bet he's into Le Mans, isn't he? As well, he does all yeah. sorts, all sorts of races. So his son that. races, doesn't he? Yeah. Well, his, his son-in-law. He's got two daughters um, who race, uh, or who did race. Uh, well, one of them still does, and then um, two sons as well. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think how did I get into it? So he he I was coming out of the navy at that stage in two thousand and eight, uh, and I got a phone call from a friend of mine. Um, at that stage, I went on to be a trustee of the Fly Navy Heritage Trust, which looks after all the old aircraft that fly as a living memorial to the six thousand four hundred thirty-seven people that have been lost in naval aviation since the formation of the Royal Naval Air Service and the, and the Fleet Tower. And um, uh, they sort of said, well, there's this guy, um, Nick Mason, he's having a problem with his helicopter, will you, will you help him? And the idea was, was that Nick just wanted me to give him a contact in a certain organisation within the UK to help him repair his helicopter. Um, the long story short was, was we, I put in, not only did I do that, you know, typical military person, you go the extra mile, I did that. I also arranged for it to be fixed and, and I flew it over to um, Oxford for it to be fixed. As I landed, um, the engineer came running up to me afterwards. I signed the aircraft in over to Oxford uh, to be repaired. And the engineer was ashen faced. And he said, uh, did you just fly this aircraft? And I was like, yeah. And he said, can, I, can, I, can you come with me a second? And I was like, oh, yeah, fine. what have I forgotten? And uh, he literally said, right, I haven't touched anything, I promise you. And I was like, okay, that's fine, yeah, right. So I got underneath where the tail where the pedal input rod meets the mechanical link which then controls the tail rotor at the back is a nut and the nut is wire locked so it can't move this one hadn't been wire locked and he literally got his finger and moved it literally honest to god three millimeters and the whole assembly fell apart and he said you were five minutes maximum before you would have lost your tail rotor in this helicopter. And the first time you'd have known about it is when you slow, slow down to come to the hover and you start spinning like a top. And I just thought about that. And I went back and told Nick. And I said to Nick, I am not going to let you, I'm not going to leave this helicopter until I know that it's safe for you to fly. And I think that's started a relationship then, which I'm now very much you know the person that he'll come to with and I, I run the helicopter so i run everything to do with its maintenance you know and he's great because he will ring me up and say look tim i want to go here tomorrow this or the other and we'll go yeah and then i can ring him up on the morning and say nick the weather's punk you know we, we shouldn't fly and he'll go great i'll get back car not a problem so he's a he's a fan, phenomenal person to work with i mean he's 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 very very humble yeah, he, I read his book. Um, Which one? I read a book of his, Inside Out. Yes, yeah, History of Pink Floyd. Yeah, yeah. and you can you can take. I mean, his personality, yes, is humble. I, I read he, of all. Well, um, Rick was very much the same, wasn't he? Rick Wright. I, very similar. I don't know him. But, uh, uh, I don't know of him. I said, well, yeah, I didn't know him either. <laughs> uh, but no, um, he seemed very much the same, very humble down to earth um, and that's what Nick seems like as well and that book was good um, but yeah yeah, the flipping heck mate you developed that trust I, I, I yeah. can bet he's not going to let you go yeah <laughs> I actually tried once I sort of said right you know maybe I should uh, he was like you're not going, you're, you're not going anywhere and you know if it, he's, he's you know he's still touring he's still got you know a saucer full of secrets um, has he really you know, I didn't know that yeah he's with Gary Kemp and a whole load of other people um, doing some uh, early Pink Floyd stuff which I Sid Barrett that. would have done that was old school crazy yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's 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 you know it's brilliant. But it's yeah. I mean, it, it, the you you find yourself in the weirdest situation. So you know he phoned me up one day and said, look, you know I need to go to 
um, uh, this airfield. And I sort of said, yeah, fine, we'll fly you up there. So we flew up there. And I was, you know, I don't ask him many questions. Um, just when you're going, when you're coming. And we got there and it was um, Nick, Jeremy Clarkson, um, you know, a whole load of other people <laughs> hooning around an airfield circuit in a Lamborghini Huracan, a, you know, top of the range AMG Mercedes and Nick's LaFerrari, you know, and it was just like it was surreal, you know. But those are the fun things. That's what I do just to forget about, you know, the day job and, and what goes on. And what is the day job? Can I ask? So I went into banking after the military and I went into um, Barclays and then um, two other organizations. And basically I looked after very, very rich people. So whether that's buying super yachts for them or planes or, or advising them the next generation on how to look after the money or investing for them. And then I think, you know, I got this whole anxiety and panic attack stuff in by being five days in London that I really turned around and went, enough's enough. I'm not going to do that anymore. So I took some of my biggest clients and formed a nucleus and then worked from home and to look after them through my own company. And it can be anything from, you know, um, I've just had one client literally yesterday whose son um, was in um, um, in Syria with the SDF um, uh, photographing the Kurds and the Yazidi people. And he needed to be medically evacuated. Um, uh, he had a, a problem and needed to be out quickly. Uh, and so, you know, I found myself yesterday arranging medevac flights and phoning US embassies and, you know, all sorts of stuff, liaising with the parents to get him out of Syria to Erbil in Iraq and then flown out from Erbil to, to you know, back to, the, back to his country of origin. So I love that sort of stuff. I lo- I'm a fixer. You know, I love, I love helping people. I love putting people in the right um, places. The problem is, is that I say yes to people too much. And, you know, I've got school fees to pay. I've got everything else to do. But I love what I do. You know, I really do love what I do. And I'm a, I guess I flit in and out of lots of things, um, uh, deliver them and then move on to the, to the next thing. You're probably a product, <coughs> product of your, your, um, you are a product of your personality and the, connect, and the connections you developed over the years. And it's one of those, <coughs> um, you're probably quite a rare individual, Tim, I'd say, in that, um, well, yeah, absolutely rare in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, absolutely rare. <laughs> don't more than I mean, one in the, me. I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, properly more rare <laughs> in that uh, you you're in a privileged position. Yeah, I'd be, it'd yeah. be fair to say, but you're aware of it. Um, you and you and you've you've you've, you've you're able to you've got an ability to help people out, and um, you do so when you can. So you're not going to stop me. Let's get more busy and more yeah. skint. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm resigned to that. But I think what it does give is that I've been very lucky over the years that I, I was a great believer that building a network will serve you better in, in future life. Absolutely. And that network has, has really um, served me well. And I've been very lucky with my network. because And the one thing I don't do is abuse that network. Um, but if that network can help or that network can... You know, change someone's lives for the better. Then why not? Yeah. What well, it's that it's one of the things I've, I've got to give a, a, a talk to. Um, I've got to give it. I've been asked to. I'm gonna uh, at rugby school up in Coventry. Yeah. So I think it's a private school. Um, I think it's a private. School. It is a private school. Okay, there we go. Right. Um, and so I like to. I've got. I've, you know, I've got a, li- a life lessons in me. A lot of advice I think I can give, but yeah, I've never put it put down a paper. And just goes along. Think, yeah, fucking hell. Um, and one of the things that I realised in think in going deep into thinking what I'm going to talk about is um, is that yes, networking is hugely powerful, not just professionally, which is commonly what I've associated with, and what I spoke about on the podcast before, and when the guests have, but personally as well. Um, in in how impactful it can be in your life in sort of a passive way and what i mean is that um uh, yeah so positive networking and getting involved with charitable or not-for-profit organizations is another example because the kind of people if you when you start networking when you start getting involved with those kind of things the kind of people you end up engaging with you basically end up filtering out your network of human beings that you know they be, it becomes more heavily populated with uh, equally minded people 
who want to help who so are inherently sort of generally more good people than bad so as you go on through like that network becomes bigger and the major and the majority of your network becomes more positive and happy and so if you hit hard times you have got help there if someone has hit hard times on help needs help you've got someone you can point to so overall your experience of going through the flipping craziness of life becomes more positive and the negatives become easier to deal with i think and and it's a more enjoyable existence yeah i think the only caveat i'd say to that is is that there are some people who who want to network with you to get something out of it yeah and you and there are there are unfortunately in this world a lot of those people so it's about so for instance of my time it's taken me a long time to learn that actually i need to really price my time and what do I mean by that? I don't mean financially. I mean intellectually um, or, 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 or of reason to price my time. Um, and so um, he's heard how good this podcast is. <laughs> yeah, he yeah, wants yeah, to yeah, come yeah, in. Yeah. Um, Helicopter. <laughs> yeah. Where to? <laughs> um, and so I think what I'm trying to say is, is you know, I, I've had bad experiences with networks as well as very good experiences. But you learn that as you go mm. through life, right? Um, so yeah, it's um, it's it's it's. But I, it's it's something that I was always put down for when I was going through Sandhurst or working through the military. You know, I always used to on the squadron. I always used to get the the, the piss taken out of me for you know handing out business cards when I was in Dubai. You know, and a meeting with Shake This or whatever, and you know, following up literally within 24 hours and saying, hi, sorry, this is me, you know, blah, 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 lovely to meet you, blah, blah, blah. And now all of those people on that squadron have all come to me and all been to me sort of saying, well, um, I need a job. How do I do it? Or who do I talk to? And this, I said, well, you remember that guy we met in 2000 in Burj Al Arab in Dubai? Yeah, well, he can help you. Bloody hell, how'd you do that? That's a network. Mm. So it works. Mm -hmm. And it's so, important. Yeah. Right. 90 minutes. Is that it? It's... Can, can, we, we go, can we go again? Go along, go along, go along <laughs> mate. In all seriousness, I would, uh, I would, you, know, I would, I'm gonna, you're gonna get another invite to come back on. Um, I'll give you a bit. I'll give you a couple of days to get over this one, um, and see where we are, veterans wise, and just and pick your brains more, mate. There's fucking loads we didn't talk about. Um, there's going to be a guy guaranteed get in touch with you called Michael Coates. He's Who's a good he? guy. He's a host of another uh, of another podcast called Declassified. Oh yes, yeah, I've right. seen him on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. about forty forty five minutes, but it's very if it, well, it is mental health, mental well being, mental fitness focused, and he would love to talk. I, I, I yeah, haven't spoken good. to him, but he will when he listens to this. In fact, I'll I'll, I'll let him off. I'll tip him off. Um, yeah, good guy. Um, shameless plug opportunity. Anything you want to mention? Any people, organizations? Well, I, what's, I, what's your website? Uh, I haven't got one. So um, uh, it, it's me. I, I'm, on, I'm on Twitter as Tim Boughton. Um, uh, but I I work with referrals. People refer people to me. They know who I am, and I work with them. Um, shameless plugs. I think that all I'd say is is get that mind for anyone who feels they're struggling. Anyone who feels that they're in going into a dark place. Please just try and read that book. It's called Mindfulness in a Frantic World by Professor Mark Williams and Danny Penman. And you can get it on Amazon. Um, it saved my life. Really genuinely mean that. And it turned my life around. For all the people that are out there as veterans who really think that nothing is being done to change the status quo, I would just say, please just pause. Just, just, just wait. Because there are things in the pipeline which should materially change the way that we are doing our business mod is really trying to make a difference i can't speak for ministers because i haven't really had that interaction with tobias selwood and mark lancaster but i can tell you that richard new g as chief of defense personnel is trying to make a difference there are elements within the government that are absolutely hell-bent on making sure that our strategy for veterans is supported and that we give them the respect that they deserve um, so, you know, I'm more than willing to amplify that if people want to get in touch. You know, I'm more than willing to speak to organisations. One of the other things that we haven't mentioned is that I go into corporate organisations and talk to their boards and their staff on mental resilience and my story and mental health. Currently, I've done 
uh, upwards of about 15, 16 of those. Um, and to give you an example, I went into an organization with the C-suite and I had uh, 20 hardened board members who were like, why the hell am I here? This is just not relevant to me. Within half an hour, half of them were in tears. And one of them was a woman who was really kick-ass in the organization. And she came up to me separately and said, I can't thank you because you've described my husband. I now recognize what my husband is going through because of what you have said through your story. So my final plea is, is for those that are out there suffering, really do reach out for help. Speak to the organizations that, that, that really should be doing their job and know that you're not alone. You're not alone um, and that you, you, know, you really can be helped. Um, and finally, finally, I think thank you for what you do because your awareness um, from the people that you have on this podcast, the diverse nature of the people that you have, really, I think, can have an impact on the veteran world. And the reason I say that is because, you know, there will always be hope found in whatever the podcast is you do. Even Brian's is, you know, you can find <laughs> you can find some hope in that one. <laughs> But I think, but I think that you know, the more we talk, the more we open up, the more we see. So, for instance, um, Andrew Fox, OCC company, Three Para, you know, contacted me and then wrote a, a, an article in the <coughs> Sunday Mail. For someone like that to open up is 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 brilliant. And what I want to do is I want to go to Sandhurst, and I'm going to go to Sandhurst, you know, uh, the Paras, and literally find a way. Of standing up in front of them and saying it's okay to talk, it's okay to open up. These are the people that have done it. It's not going to impact your career. You've got to start, you know, um, regarding it as mental fitness rather than a, a, a disorder. And this is the last thing: is that this whole thing around PTSD, the D of PTSD, the disorder bit, is not helpful. It's a hangover from Vietnam and the Americans and, and the classification of what that was. You know, it is, um, it is stress trauma from life which we can deal with and we can you know we can minimize as much as we can so mate listen thanks i appreciate the kind so words much. yeah i'm just gonna leave you with something post-traumatic growth yeah michael Coates used that term i love he coined it but yeah, yeah. yeah no but so thank you for the kind words and uh i can enjoy that awesome yeah, i loved it thanks, thanks a lot, lot. take care mate.